introducing qualitative grids, construing sibling relationships. Uh, so here is a visiting professor at the University of Hertfordshire. I've heard it's called Hertz as well. Oh, oh, for sure, sorry. Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire. <laughs> Hertfordshire. <laughs> right. And the inventor, actually, I like to say that, the inventor of the preceder element grid. What is striking about Harry's work is that it is both theoretically sound and rigorous and also practical, which is really rare that the two go together. Before being professor, Harry has experience in family therapy, uh, adult and child adolescent mental health. He's published over 50 papers. He now teaches in countries all over the world. Um, and we're really lucky to have him with us today, so I don't want to overintroduce you, but Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks for coming. Lovely to see you all. Um, I've been pleased to have as a uh, clinical psychologist for most of my career with an interest in working with families. Um, also, personal construct psychology was a very important framework for me and uh, when I did research before I went into clinical training, um, I did a PhD looking at interpersonal perception in families and that's really the, the germ of all the ideas I've had since. Um, I'm tending to call it personal and relational construct psychology now to emphasize the relational aspects of, of construction. Um, like at the end of Mike's workshop, he said he critiqued PCP for being, tending to be a little bit too, seeing the individual as a bit primary and emphasizing that we are in relation right from the start of life. So that very much informs my thinking. Uh, so that's the sort of theoretical background, but this afternoon I want to be more practical and look at some methods that I've developed called qualitative grids, um, of which there are several forms. And I'm going to take you through just uh, practicing these. Uh, I'll, I'll give you exercises in which you can uh, practice them. If you don't finish them, you know, usually when you're doing a grid, uh, there's, a, there's a lot to think about in thinking about a situation or a system of relationships. Um, so if you don't actually finish the exercise, if I rush you on, I apologise, but the, the, the goal of it today is to uh, have you understand how to actually do it so that you can use it in, in your future work. So there is something called the perceiver element grid, episode perceiver grid, and perceiver diet and triad grid, and there's a middle category there you can try through. Um, you can apply, uh, I'll get that, to, I'll get to that one when we get there. Uh, so I've sort of put a few uh, goals for today there, which uh, hopefully makes sense. I have put some links here, but I tried it last night and they don't work. So um, bear with me. What I will do is get these slides out on the Academia website. It, uh, when it, it did them. work. I find it very hard to work from the iPad. Yeah. Um, it's very frustrating, so I couldn't change them. Um, Just like to let you know the academia, uh, I was able to get the PowerPoint from that. Oh, you were? Great. So if you, you, if you actually want the PowerPoints right now, uh, you should be able to get them on your phones or whatever. Okay, so the, uh, what does thinking relationally really mean? Um, I started off, when I started off, um, in university at Bristol, I was doing chemistry. And I, I rather liked chemistry when I was at school. When I got to university, I found it was getting too technical and too obscure. And I was getting interested in psychology. I had a friend who was doing psychology. Um, I could do a subsidiary subject in chemistry. Uh, but there's some rather nice metaphors that one can still use. Okay, so what is that first one? It's, it's an oxygen atom with two hydrogens on it. And the point of the metaphor is that indivi as individuals, when we are in relations, when we're in situations with different people, we are transformed into almost into different, different people. Yeah. Uh, so 
when oxygen, which is a gas, and hydrogen, which is another gas, come together, they, they're transformed into water. Okay. And so you've got, uh, that is, uh, they two oxygen atoms, and they are in so-called covalent bond, which is a sort of equality. There's a, so two items come together on an equal basis, as opposed to good old common salt, in which two atoms come together, positive and negative charge. And that rather is rather reminiscent of a distinction that Gregory Bateson made. He said that two people in relation can be in a, a symmetrical relationship, and that means the behaviour of one is met with similar behaviour of the other. That can be positive or negative, that can be friendship meeting, so warmth meeting warmth, or it could be fighting, but f from similar actions. Whereas uh, that is rather reminiscent of Bateson's idea of a complementary relationship in which you somehow get a difference. So you could say a teacher and a pupil. That would be a good example of a complementary relationship. And then you can play with other sorts of uh, molecules, groups of different kinds. Okay, so that's just a list for reference of, of the quantitative groups that I've developed so far. Now, I'm also using as an example to work on these an interesting topic, which is sibling relationships. Most of us have got siblings. If you're an only child and you're trying to do one of these exercises, you can imagine having a sibling, or you can think of a friend of yours, a sibling, or you could forget families and just think of team relationships or um, groups of friends or do fine or colleagues in a, in a team. Okay. Siblings are interesting relationships. And there's a very good paper by Judith Dunn and uh, Dunn and Plowman, uh, 1991, it's in Family Process. Uh, they say siblings are, you know, the behavioural genetics, but Plowman was a, uh, Dunn is an excellent developmental psychologist, Plowman was a behavioural geneticist. And they, so they summarise things, siblings who have 50% similar genetically and grow up within the same family. Nevertheless, <coughs> nevertheless differ markedly in personality and psychopathology. Most of these sibling differences cannot be explained by genetic factors. These findings from the field of behavioural genetics imply that within family processes that lead to sibling differences, or the non-shared environment, are crucial for understanding environmental differences on individual development. Okay, so that might strike you as being rather strange to say that two siblings from the same family have a non-shared environment. Of course, as we begin to look into this field to see what that means. <coughs> so to summarise that, siblings are very different, tend to be. Heredity accounts for a meagre sibling resemblance that is observed. Genetic cannot account for the majority of differences within pairs of siblings, environmental influences that affect the development of non-shared There's a book there called Separate Lives by the which if you're interested in the case up. Again, some more general statements from Dunn and Plowman. Obviously there are within differences also, but, you know, I've got a I've got a friend who, whose him and his brother were uh, their parents split up when they were about 18 and 16 and the older one who was my, my friend uh, went to stay uh, in a, a, with a family and uh, went to a very good school the younger one carried on with his father and uh, stepmother a couple more years uh, and it was a sort of forces situation at uh, the army, uh, no it's the RAF, the Royal Air Force and uh, he basically went into a very uh, working class sort of environment so you have the difference of class if you like in the cultural aspects of two different classes and these two lines just went off in totally different directions. So obviously there are extra familial um, factors such as the peer group that you end up with at school and later on. Child 
chance events as well. So, the first technique I'm going to introduce is called the perceiver element grid. Uh, and I'm going to use as an example uh, a social construct psychologist called Dorothy Rowe, who you've probably heard of because she's, a very, she's become a very popular writer as she is on the left. As far as I know, she's still living in uh, London. Um, the big, the, the most well-known book, clinical book that she wrote was uh, called The Way Out of Your Prison Depression in 1985, which is a very good, a very good book, actually. It's the strongest. But she came out in 2007 with this one called My Dearest Enemy, My Dangerous Friend, and it, it looks at sibling relationships from many different uh, sources, artists and writers and famous people who have written about their accounts of being siblings. But uh, what I've chosen from her book is her own experiences. She, she uh, at various points during, during the book, she comes back to her own experiences. She had a sister called Myra, who uh, was eight years older than her, um, and uh, describes the various family situations. Now, when you're using a perceiver element grid, you can take the material from just clinical interviews, and you can use it in, when you're interviewing families or if you're um, working in industry or some of your organisations, you can just take it from uh, discussions, you can take it from transcripts. In this case, I'm taking it from the text of the book. Try the, idea, the whole idea of personal construct psychology is you, you, you try not to impose any meaning at all. You try to use the meanings that are coming out of the person's mouth or out of their text. Uh, as faithfully as possible. So what I did was, um, in this first grid, it's not actually terribly readable, is it? Can you read it? Yeah. If I read it, then uh, it'll help, I think. So the way the perceiver element grid works is that you have a perceiver here. I've only, uh, this is just a, the first row, which is Dorothy's perceptions, okay? We don't have the perceptions of the other members of the family. If we wanted to know what the mother thought, we would put her here and then write down how she saw herself, how she saw her husband, how she saw Myra, how she saw Dorothy. But we're only looking at, at this point, at Dorothy's views, okay? So what she says about her mother is that she always talked of aches and pains and complained fiercely and endlessly about the world never talked of sex and she resented my arrival she uses the term fell pregnant i always felt my existence shamed her pregnancy was a fall from grace the mother the mother was not when my mother was not coping uh, with my early when she was born uh, she sent my sister to to an aunt that's right, when, when, when she was born, she sent the older sister to live with an aunt. She had breast abscesses, so that was interfering with the feeding. It says here, so we've got Dorothy's view of her mother here, and we've got Dorothy's view of herself. So I had trouble feeding. She also had this illness called bronchoextasis, needing needing the sticky mucus that was being overproduced in the lungs to be coughed up. Um, so she was very breathless. And she describes her mother about this as saying, uh, she complained that my coughing disturbed her sleep. She gave me boiled sweets to prevent me coughing. So she did the very opposite of what she was supposed to do, which is to get this mucus coming out. Um, then she reports her sister saying, Myra told me that mother rubbed my face in my wee, in my urine, uh, when I was a baby. So it's not a very pretty picture of her mother. Um, I put that there. Uh, I was born to parents who did not want me. If you look at the book afterwards, those are the page numbers where, where these quotes come from. My father told me, what's here? Uh, when, when I was 20, he told me, 
that he had to work hard to love me because I was a girl and he wanted a boy. And the history is that there had been a boy born between uh, Myra and herself three years previously. Well, no, he wasn't born, he was conceived, but uh, they had an abortion. She says of her sister Myra, she knew nothing of my imminent arrival. She was told at school, you are very lucky to have a baby sister. So that she was actually at school when the news came that Dorothy had been born. She says of her, I had caused her to be taken from her mother, her father, her treasured bedroom, when I was an in, whereas I was an intruder. And then she guesses how Myra must have felt. A vast emptiness must have opened up inside her. Years later, I discovered that this was how she experienced the fear of annihilation as a person. And of herself, she says, to survive, I had to watch the family closely and anticipate their actions. Mm. Okay. So, uh, anyone want to make any comments on that? Or? Mm. Now, please. When, um, when, when did Dorothy come up with these? these, um, these in some cases, they're, they're somewhat factual in their cases, but in other cases, they're inferential, right? So she's making yep. making determinations as to what must yep. what Myra must have felt, etc. The, the rule of filling in the grid is that, that anything that refers to either self or other goes into the relevant place. It could be an inference, it could be a question, it could be... But it's the question of when, when was Dorothy actually relating these, these kinds of pieces? So these would be derived uh, from, an derived from over time? Yeah, I mean, she probably planned writing this book for many years, uh, mm -hmm. and it comes from the autobiographical text. Okay, so what, what I'm getting at is that these ideas may have actually occurred at different kinds of times oh, yeah. and then she's imposing them on, 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 on top of the relational structure that she has with her, her mother and her father and, and her sister. Yeah. So they may or may not be felt by the other individuals oh, in the well, way that she is. That's, an ante that's anticipating where we're going. Okay. The point about this is another peg in which there are uh, two people being concerned, okay? Dorothy and her sister, Myra. And these are the perceivers. So the perceivers there, and these are the elements. And that arrow there means that we read the grid from left to right, okay? So the convention, I just decided it. The thing is, these can get a bit, un uh, a bit confusing. So it's a good idea to adhere to a convention of reading. To me, it makes sense to go from left to right. So. That square there is Dorothy's view of herself. That's the element in Greek terms. That's Myra's view of Dorothy. That's Dorothy's view of Myra, and that's Myra's view of herself. But as Roland correctly points out, this is all overall from Myra's uh, perspective. But of course you can use this if you're working with two people, say you're working with a couple, you can get them to feel their actual perception yeah, yeah. rather than their guesses. So, according to Dorothy, <laughs> okay. Does that? Yeah, that, that, that's where I was going. Yeah, 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 great. Okay, so here again we have a, a, a situation where Dorothy says, hang on, let me use my bigger version of it. Um, I was jealous of Myra. Myra treated me with great contempt, so I felt there was something intrinsically contemptible about me. I longed for her to take favourable notice of me and be interested in me. When you're looking at the peg, the diagonals are self-concepts. So we can say that's Dorothy's view of herself, that's Myra's view of herself, of course, according to Dorothy. So, all there is in the text is to repeat that first point in the other grid. A vast emptiness must have opened up inside her, a fear of annihilation. 
Dorothy about Myra directly. <coughs> she was jealous of me, so they're both jealous of each other, according to her. But she either ignored me, used me for her own ends. If I caught her attention, she would look at me curiously with fascinated disgust as if I was a loathsome slug under a stove. She could get me to do anything by telling me that if I did not, my father would be inconvenienced and upset. Okay. The point of using the, uh, the example, I think, is <coughs> it's uh, intensely emotional and traumatic, really, content. Uh, makes, makes it more memorable as an example for practicing this method. I'm hoping that when you look at your own situation, it won't be quite so uh, difficult. I'm going to invite you to fill in a page from your own experience. It's quite personal material, so it's just for your eyes only. If you feel like sharing any of it, uh, you can do, but don't feel that you have to. Uh, so that makes it easier to fill uh, the thing in. But if you uh, uh, don't want to go to your family situation, uh, as I said earlier, just uh, his friends instead. So just to clarify, uh, we can either have each person filling in their own peg and guessing what others would put in, it's just like that one, or we can do it conjointly during or after the interview. The interviewer fills in the conjoint peg on a large piece of paper or flip chart, drawing on the contributions of each member. So I was working with a team I had a great big piece of paper. I got each person to write privately on a piece of paper uh, and then to share what they felt like sharing and I'd fill it in onto a big sheet of paper. Okay. There is quite a nice research method that one can use. Um, okay, that's making the same point again. This is derived from only one witness, Dorothy. We can usefully use qualitative grids in this way. Even more useful is when we get each protagonist views and put these together in contract grids. So what you can do is um, wait a minute, I yeah. In the research method, let's say with two people, you can get them each to fill in their own two by two peg. Then you can get them to share it with each other and discuss what they've put. And then get them to repeat it at the end after the discussion. And that in itself, just getting them to share what they've thought about themselves and the other and how they guess the other sees self and other is an incredibly powerful tool and it's described in a couple of things that I've written. One on a paper of working with children uh, and one about a case of ADHD in which a boy and his father uh, each fill in a peg and discuss it. And that is discussed in a video which you can look on YouTube. Has anyone seen these videos at all? Um, it's easy to get to. Um, I hope these links work, but if you if you put into YouTube Harry Potter a qualitative grid or something, you'll find it. Okay, so get yourself a piece of paper and uh, probably put it sideways. Leave yourself plenty of room and draw up a, a table a bit like that. <coughs> So just to clarify, you've got three people, if you choose, and the suggestion that you use an example from your own family or maybe another family that you know well and which self becomes the protagonist in this family. So if you've got a friend saying you want to look at their family, uh, 
you can put that in the place of where it says sell. Yeah. And then a couple of siblings, you may have more than two. If you have only one, you can put a friend in, or you could just do a two by two. So write the names in in, the, in place of those titles. Just to clarify again, that's direct perception, A's view of A, A's view of B, A's view of C. You're guessing how B would see A, so that's A's view of B, view of A. And every combination that you can get from that. I don't know if that clarifies it or confuses you. <laughs> so that it, when you've got second super, um, when I saw your example of Dorothy, the A to A was Dorothy's view of Dorothy in the context of Dorothy's the view of that Dorothy, Dorothy's view of Myra. Yeah, but Dorothy's view of uh, uh, um, yeah, because that's the position. Dorothy's view of the uh, view of Myra's view of herself. Yeah. Yeah. Dorothy's view of Myra's view of herself. But in the A to A, when I've got a two by two group, it's Dorothy. I took it to be Dorothy's view of Dorothy in the context of this relationship. Now it's Dorothy's view of Dorothy yes, in the context of both relationships. So well, then you've raised another problem. important point, which hopefully I'm coming to. It's possible to fill these things out. Have you got a brother or sister? So You have a brother, don't you? A clever one. Yeah. So um, you could think of just, uh, what's he called again? He's Bill. So you, Bob here can think of himself and his brother Bill in general. And you can make some entries. Or you can think, last week I was with my brother and we had a discussion about so-and-so. Or, you know, I can remember an instant in my childhood where we had a big argument. So you can use it as about a general relationship where you can look and focus on a particular situation. My question was, so that now when I think about A to A in the context of A and C, that's quite a different A to A than the one I think about in the context of yes. A and C. Yeah, well you're beginning to enter the yeah. complexity. I mean two two by twos, I think, not yeah. one two by three. Basically, it's important to say that quantitative grids are very flexible. Yeah. So as you're doing it, let's say you're working in an interview situation, more information comes. It might be a another person comes into the situation. So you can just add them as another column in the row. Yeah? Or it may be that, as Bob's saying, there's two different situations, either C is present or not. So you'd have a peg for when C is present and another one for, from when he's not. Yeah etc. And it's possible to actually develop forms that reflect the situation that you want to study. So this summarises the exercise. Some from your own family or family you know well. Choose three people, self sibling one, sibling two. Draw up a grid large enough to add extra material. That's the other thing. You get a nice big piece of paper, uh, you can write quite small because you'll have more ideas or whatever you can add them on. And is it, is, Here, it res, is it just restricted to three? Or no, you can have a so a 15 have, by 15. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Of course it's not restricted. No. But uh, you tend to focus on something that yeah. makes sense of that. Okay, so that is all the instructions. I'll give you five minutes. Uh, I'd love to give it, I mean, I can remember doing, the first time I started doing this stuff, I, it was in Stuttgart in a PCP conference, I don't know if anyone was at that. Bill really isn't here, he would have been there. Um, and I did a peg and it, everybody took three hours to do it. <laughs> so it's potentially pretty powerful and uh, people have reflected. Now, if anyone's got a question for me or confusion, just call me over and I'll come and help you. Is anyone a bit unclear still about the task? You going to have a go? Has anyone got a spare piece of paper? Have you got a pencil?
coming over here, I was listening to an interview got uh, Daniel Cohen has been uh, interviewed in Montreal, of course. And he said that him and Dylan got together, Bob Dylan in Paris, uh, on an occasion and compared notes about how they write songs. And uh, Lenny Cohen took three years to write a three verse song. And he asked Bob, uh, how long did it take you to write I and I, which was one of Lenny's favourite Dylan songs? Uh, 15 minutes <laughs> and it's got about 20 verses <laughs> ok so uh, before we move on does anyone want to make any comments I mean uh, if it feels ok to say something about what you've done fine but don't feel any pressure on you and he, and he had a bit of a discussion with uh, what's your name uh? Tristan. Tristan yeah you haven't changed your name since my class too late <laughs> um, yeah, uh, obviously if you're doing that exercise where you get two people to fill them in and then dis and they know of course that they're going to be discussing it, it influences the uh, stuff a lot of course. Just you could get round that but if you were working with them you could ask each individual to fill in their private quiz that would never be shared. But I'm not sure what the point of that would really be. does speak of the incredible power of relationships to alter experience and construe. Okay, so is it okay to move on? So the next type of grid is called the event. That E can stand for a number of words. Uh, you usually call it an event perceiver grid. Could be, well, that should become clear. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly show you this, not go into it too much of time, but um, the first publication of this method was uh, Cain and Abel, as portrayed by Byron, the poet, in a play called by, uh, Cain and the Mystery. And what he does is he traces the rapid development of, of construing through the interaction of Cain and Abel five minutes before Cain kills Abel. They've got big religious differences. Abel's very devout. Cain is very questioning and probably an atheist. Um, he goes off on a journey. Uh, yeah, he goes off on a journey and comes back and uh, is quite disturbed by what he's seen. Um, and they get together. And Abel starts to say, you know, he, he basically starts saying, you're." Uh, you're looking very strange, you know, your, your eyes are flashing with un unnatural light, you're suffering from a delusion. So we've got two factors coming together there, Abel and Cain have very different religious ideological positions, if you like, and then with Cain coming into the situation, Abel starts to say, you know, he starts to make some rather pejorative judgments about him. Cain starts off trying to cooperate, Abel says he should you should uh, make a sacrifice. Uh, Abel is a, um, is a shepherd. No. He's a tiller. Cain's a, which one's which again? Cain is the... Uh, uh, Abel uh, basically is going to sacrifice a lamb, isn't he? And when, when he does, Cain, the, um, the member of RSPCA, um, is incensed by the fact that he can smell blood, loses his temper, and the murder takes place. I could spend more time on going on that, but it is in print, so you can look at this. It's called uh, a paper called Cain and Mystery. So let's look at an example. To, to, what we're doing in this sort of grid is looking at construing between, in this case, two people over a, a, a period of episodes. Okay. Those episodes can be very rapid, and this is clinically very useful for looking at very rapidly developing situations like arguments, violence, um, and, and this, that's the word I'm sorry. Um, so child problems, often there's an escalation very quick, and it's very helpful to break the thing down into steps and look at it. 
or you can use it over much longer periods of time looking at uh, what I would call eras. So the EPG can be an event, episode, or era, if you like, for different lengths of time. Now let's look at what happens in uh, Dorothy's family. She describes an incident where um, it's her grandmother's uh, 75th birthday party. And that in this case, I um, put Dorothy as one of the perceivers. The perceivers are here in this grid. And this is just other family members in general. So she says, I spent all day with my mother and my aunts with the preparations I fetched and carried. She's five years old. Um, she says of the family members, it should have been obvious to any adult that the party was a very important thing for me. So they sit down and eat and uh, a person that she doesn't know comes into the party to sit down and there isn't a chair. And her mother says, um, he can have Dot's put Dorothy's place. She doesn't need to sit at the table. So poor old Dorothy is sort of displaced from the, from the dinner party. The next event, or the next episode was that Dorothy ran out of the room. My heart stood still. I had to get away, I had to hide. I ran down the hall and out of the front gate into the night and hid in my father's car, that's part of my And she sat in the back seat of the car, it's quite graphic in the book. Um, no one came to search for me. I could not expose myself to all those eyes and the clucking about how I got over my little upset. Couldn't feel that she could go back. But eventually my father appeared at the side of the car asking if I would like something to eat. I shook my head and I shrank back into the corner of the back seat. And afterwards she reflects on it. But I did not forget, that night I began my journey away from my family. You got to, and she quotes Nina Simone, you've got to learn to leave the table when love's no longer being served. And as far as the other family members are concerned, no mention has ever made that incident. Okay, so poignant example of how you might trace an experience over rapid time. Um, so let me get you to do a similar thing. Now you've got a choice, you can, if you're looking at yourself and a sibling, say, you can look at what it was like in childhood, what it was like in adolescence, what it was like in early adulthood, late adulthood. So you've got two types of, you, you've got what I've put along there is seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years. So you might be in the seconds and minutes time frame, that would be rapid, or you might be in the months and years. So an example of the first would be just three episodes, a bit like we've just seen. And then the second one it could be uh, what should say in childhood and adolescence. So I'm saying current, current, current situation, yeah. So that might be a typical thing you do in some individual therapy, getting people to um, And then what goes in there, what is perceived? And the answer is it, that's open. So you can just say at time one I was experiencing this situation in the following way. It could be about, it could include the other, it could include the self, it could include some other things about what was going on. Okay, so that's very open for you to put in what you want. So choose which one you want to do and fill in one of those. Anyone have a question? Anyone still so could you explain the perspective of other? In that. So it's the, the other again is uh, one of your siblings. Because the self's yes. uh, the other's view it's again is called the pure yeah. yeah. Instructions? Yeah. Can you see yourself giving this to somebody else? Would you be clear about how to do that? Yeah. 
I mean, they're better. So I was just going to say, it's really important to do it yourself because you need to know how uncomfortable it makes you feel. Yeah. So when you're doing it for something else, yeah. you have to know, and you have, and to, you have to, to felt it to do it. You need to use all the options for sensitive to do it. Yeah. I'm all sensitive to it. I'm sensitive Yeah, I mean, they're, disarm in a way, they're disarmingly simple methods, uh, but they, they're also, I think, very, very powerful. And Tristan was saying earlier that um, um, about the effect of actually, or in our discussion, we were talking about the effect of actually filling these things in. I mean, a bit like, uh, you know, you've got a feeling that, as Mike was saying earlier, you can have a pre-verbal construing. It doesn't have to have any words attached to it. And a lot, as Kelly says somewhere, there are, you put it very graphically, but there are thousands of constructs that are nameless. You know, we talk about those charts. It's more you know, Mike's example of the relationship. I mean, obviously, that's a rather um, you know, simplistic example of you know, constructs you need, but it, but it was a very nice way of showing it. But we're going to have a myriad of feelings, aren't we, in those sort of situations of going into a, into a dance hall with all sorts of them. And, and many of them aren't labelled. So, in a way, you were a bit worried that actually doing the task might distort the data, as it were, as if there is such a thing as data that is separate from history, which of course, according to this novel, there isn't. Um, but putting things into words profoundly changes, changes it. Uh, hopefully for the better, because it increases our reflectiveness on it and thereby increases our sense of control and choice. But maybe there are some aspects of life that should be well left to learn in terms of language. Anyone want to share a one of their examples? Who, how many of you did a rapid one? In terms of seconds and minutes. Anyone do that? Yeah? The rest of you did for long periods of time? Let me have some comments please on how useful it felt or anything. Yeah. I think the one that I did is really helpful if I could share it with that family member, but I can't because they're not here anymore. But it's still. What well, you mean they died? Yes. Yes. So it's still a pondering on it. So yeah. Something I never understood at that time yeah. as a child. Yeah. It's, it was just out of. Do you I think it, of that person. Do you think even doing it was a, was a bit... Uh, was it a bit yes, because I was able to bring in a construct like, you know, from her point of view, it's not easy just to drop things to have to get into the car to try to pick you up. Yeah. Which I had thought of before. Yeah. The others. yeah. I mean, that speaks, I don't know if everyone gathered that, but De Deborah said that she was uh, considering a person who's sadly no longer with, with her. Um, but that speaks of the uh, very important point that when people die, the relationship does not die. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And that informs Bob Niemeyer's excellent work on bereavement, if you've had a look at that, in which he, when he's working with people who have lost somebody, he'll often have a photograph there in the session of that person. And you can continue to have a conversation with somebody. Of course, it's still all your constructions. It doesn't mean it's not healthy, Tristan. I actually have something that kind of goes along the lines with that. Well, it's a personal thing. Um, so I went in years, but I, I can just talk about it. Um, Make sure everyone can hear. Yeah, so my, my parents actually, um, they lost me uh, in a sense of uh, I transitioned from female to male. Um, so they lost a daughter, but they gained a son. Um, so the perception of the, like, of the, of the event, or what happened, basically, um, it was like a death for them. So they yeah. mourned a little bit. Yeah. They got understood, but they mourned. And yeah. Then, yeah, they also celebrated as well. For me, it was the beginning of a new life. My life, a life. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. So, yeah. 
Thanks for sharing that. Both of you. I'm, I'm kind of the classic uh, Tom Soloway birth order model of having an eldest brother, another brother who was in constant conflict with him. I'm the third born yeah. and a latter born. Yeah. And I think we're, and that dynamic hasn't shifted throughout the years. No. I think our tolerance is becoming a little more palpable. Yeah. Um, but the classic uh, scenario of birth order for me is oh, yeah, huge. Like, I hope there's time today to give you a final grid, which I've called the sibling order grid, which looks a bit of that. Um, but it, going back to, do you remember that concept that uh, Dan and Bowman was non-shared environment? To be a firstborn with two younger brothers is one thing. To be a middleborn with a brother and a brother. To be a younger brother with two older brothers, non-shared environment. Yeah. 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 And so much psychology and clinical psychology and study of psychopathologies and things just completely cuts through that complexity, doesn't it? Just, you know, uh, just taking one child from a family according to their social class and then yeah. all those demographic trends here. You know, it does miss it. Sorry, Hannah. What Hello. can you tell us uh, about uh, uh, using this grid uh, uh, together with the patient uh, or to ask the patient uh, to do alone because it's very different yes. because it's not uh, easy to write uh, about uh, some very upset uh, things uh, and so on people generally avoid Yes. And so what about uh, well, the different when you can ask the patient uh, uh, to write uh, and why yeah. to do in a way or in another I'm way? I'm so glad you asked that question because it's so central. I mean, I don't know how many of you work in clinical context, but you know, the sensitivity required within clinical context should apply to any research context as well. So, but obviously you only use a tool like this when it feels right and you judge that it's going to be okay with your family, with your individual, okay? And that leads me to say that a lot of modern practice for getting people to fill in questionnaires before you've even seen people to write down what their problem is and, you know, and then use that data to inform clinical decision making is absolutely unacceptable according to me. You know, it's atrocious and it's just economically driven. Sure attempts at shortcutting. And I often say when I'm working with, uh, when I'm teaching family therapists, there's a, there's a tool called the genogram, a family tree, which people often use in the first session working with the family. And they, they, you shouldn't do it. I don't think you should do it. Uh, you're forcing them to begin to share stuff that, you know, you haven't yet created the environment between you and them and between them and each other for them to be, you know, the disclosure of information or the sharing of new thoughts or whatever should happen in a very organic, natural way. Okay. So, yes, don't use one of these grids cold. Explain it, say it's quite useful to sometimes write, write ideas down and to, uh, to clarify things and that sort of thing. Do you think that would be quite something that we could do? I think I found it very useful to do it. Um, and you know, you get that, that permission to do it. You might be working with a couple, uh, and you'd have to preface it. You know, we all have thoughts that we feel that we can share, thoughts that we keep to ourselves, thoughts that we can't even bear to look at ourselves. So just put down what feels uh, like I did with yourself. Okay. Does that answer some of those points? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's steam on. Uh, did you read that, by the way? Mm -hmm. Past events do not cause later experience. Okay. They are construed in a way that governs later experiences. That's Dorothy's comment. Great. So I've always argued that, that the experiences of today reinform the way you even respond to experiences of the past. So in that sense, obviously, they can cause Past doesn't exist, does it? Where is it? 
it's in the present, in the future. I mean, Mike, it's lovely this morning talking about, you know, we live in the future. I couldn't agree more, but actually it is happening in the present. The anticipation is happening now. Christine. What about genetics? Like, say... Does genetics like, um, cause tendencies? Things? It's different instance, workshop. If you're talking about, like... <laughs> <laughs> no, but if you're talking about, like, say, I don't know, uh, you said uh, past events do not cause later experience. Yeah. Well, what happens if you have, say, I don't know, alcoholism or something in your family, right? Yeah. And so you've observed an event uh, in your, when you were younger, and it, it eventually, you know, you got into that pattern yeah. of... Of and course, causes and I cut across you because I'm anxious of time, but using alcohol as an example, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, PCP's been lumped in with constructivism generally, which includes radical constructivism, which says that, you know, that, uh, does, the past, uh, does reality exist at all? Right. Uh, as Kelly takes a medium position on this. The world does exist. Thoughts exist. Alcohol causes sclerosis of the liver. Yeah. yeah. That is, of course. There are such things as causes and effects. But when we get into psychology and when we get into our human experience, to say that, you know, when sensory experience happens, it's what's causing this now, is very problematic. Right. There's always a construction. Right. When we were talking about cells, you could say that the, the liver was construing the alcohol that came along and destroyed it. <laughs> okay, so let's just take a bit of a quick. Um, oh, do, do people want a break? Do you have breaks? I've got a bit late, so it's probably best if you don't. Or the fag break, as we call it. That's probably the wrong word to use. In, uh... Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to look at, uh, beginning to look at construing of relationships, not just construing of individuals. Um, Mike shared the sociality, sociality corollary with us this morning, that uh, to the extent that we can construe another's construes, uh, <coughs> we can play a role with them, Kelly. It's a very powerful corollary, it's, uh, it's a great tool in therapy. Uh, I've argued that promoting interpersonal understanding is a key curative factor in family therapy. It underlies the whole stance that Kelly said we should take towards the people we work with to take their, to be very careful about finding how they see things and to be respectful of that and accepting, not necessarily taking it in by it. But it only really refers to the construing of one other person and what I argue is that when you're beginning to construe two people at once in situations we need to be thinking about how uh, you construe the relationship between their positions and all sorts of other things that happen when you begin to look at live and kicking interaction so I've argued that to the, to the extent that the person can construe the relationships between members of a group, he or she can make, take part in a group process with them. Okay. So there's an example of a person construing A, construing B in interaction. Those arrows are a bow tie, I don't know if you've come across a bow tie diagram, but I won't go into that now because there isn't time. But Basically, the person's construing how each construes and their actual behaviours and actions and feelings and speech and how that all connects together. If you are the person yourself in the dyad, two people, A is construing the whole thing, B is construing the whole thing. I'm just going to miss that one. Um, so, there are different types of constructs that are applied to individuals 
and to interactions and relationships. So the, the construct friendly versus critical, I think you're rather critical, I think you're friendly is obviously applied to the person as an individual, something they're characteristic, they you could say, uh, their behavior, that person over there looks as if they're very dangerous or they're, they're very vulnerable. You know, we're walking along the streets, there's quite a lot of beggars in Montreal, aren't there? Mm -hmm. And somebody comes along and says to them, you might make a judgment about, uh, is that person very vulnerable or are they actually quite aggressive? Um, that's a description about their behaviour, so about their feelings, their behaviour, their characteristics. That all comes under the category of monadic history, history of the person as an individual in their own right. And that is a type of constraint that has been very uh, hugely emphasised in the traditional repertory grid, in which you usually use individuals as elements. Okay. Very powerful, it communicates a lot. But we might want to move also and to supplement that with dyadic constraints. So if I'm construing the relationship between two people, I might say, well, they're being very polite to each other. Or I might think, uh, yeah, they're, they're being very polite to each other. Um, what's my point going to be? Polite versus honest. That's yeah, so they're being a bit false with each other just to sort of keep the, you know, the atmosphere polite. Or you know, in a different situation, they might be um, talking very, very frankly to each other. So that might be a judgment I'm making about two people in the interaction. Uh, the, this example comes from Gregory Bateson, who studied animals, uh, was it monkeys? Monkeys in a zoo, and looking at their interactions. And we noticed, as we all know, with uh, our pets, you know, dogs particularly, uh, dogs love playing, they'll come on and snap at you, but they're still playing. Or they might suddenly turn nasty and start growling, <coughs> and really be uh, wanting to fight you genuinely, getting, getting angry. So what Bateson concluded from these observations is that there are two levels of communication, always, in a, in a situation. There's the content of the communication, what you're that are uh, actually expressing or whatever, but you're also communicating something about the relationship between them. Um, in the case of these animals, they're somehow, obviously not verbally, saying, this is play. And there's a sort of agreement between them that they're just play type of relationship. And when they suddenly flip over into, uh, into a different uh, emotional pattern of uh, fighting, uh, that that construct is dropped in favor of the trust pole of fighting versus play. And he called that how the relationship is being defined. And it's important to say it's a very dynamic, ongoing thing that uh, is actually being con constructed in, uh, uh, in the moment, in the interaction. So that's, uh, and then we can so there we're talking about construing two people, dyadics, and then how do you construe what happens in three people situation? Uh, so an example of that would be A and B are making fun of C. Okay, I have this example of children in the playground, and you're looking out of the window, you're in the staff room, if you're a teacher, and you can see without even hearing what they're saying, a lot from the way they just move and the gestures and the postures and the distance and the closeness with which they're standing or moving around with each other. A uh, huge amount of um, information comes just from observation without any language involved. Another example of triadic construing is A needs to be present to prevent B bullying C. Okay, and this goes back to some sibling examples maybe. So, to A needs to be present to prevent B from bullying C versus neglecting B and C. Okay. 
So there's a lot of additional data involved in construing live interaction. Okay. We look at their interactions with the baton, taking gestures, body language, distance, closeness, hierarchy, competition, how much they're agreeing or disagreeing, how much they're understanding or misunderstanding. We go through that incredibly quickly. But all those constructs I regard as being perfect. Kelly talks about professional constructs, that's the constructs that we use as, uh, uh, as interviewers, as, as clinicians, to guide our work. Examples being the emotions that Mike was talking about this morning. Sorry, I'm aware some of you weren't at that workshop, but when Kelly talks about anxiety, for instance, as being confronted by events outside the scope of your construct system, if you feel anxious, that's a professional construed, which is useful for a clinician to, uh, to be able to use in the work. And, uh, so if we say again that there are some constructs that are good for looking at individuals, some that are good for looking at relationships, so all those, outgoing person, bad temper, tidy, stubborn, or applied to individuals being interested in each other, agreeing or disagreeing with each other, understanding or misunderstanding each other, one person putting another person down, those are dyadic constructs. And finally, a couple of triadic, she treats me like my mother did, that's um, one child saying, um, oh no, it's, it's about a, a husband in, in couple therapy saying that my wife treats me just like my mother did, that's, construct involving three what uh, Valeria in an excellent ex uh, article in the process recently described as systemic thinking yeah. uh, and uh, a child might say oh mum's unfair she lets my brother get away with things and there's sibling rivalry so um, we can also say that dynamic constructs can be directional. So, uh, Ryle and, uh, Anthony Ryle, who went on to found cognitive analytic therapy, um, developed a tool called the Dyad Grid, which is a traditional repertory grid in which the elements were people but were pairs of people. And he did them both ways, so it could be A to B and B to A. So we get things like um, uh, looks up, A okay, looks after B, or A okay, respects B, and that sort of thing. So let's just have a look at, at the first grid I showed you from Dorothy again. We can classify these statements that she made. Uh, in yellow, we've got my magic. So we've got my mother, uh, my own mother always talked of aches and pains and complained fiercely and endlessly about the world. Never talked of sex, okay? Monadic. Um, she had breast axis, abscesses. I had bronchiolitis. Okay. A vast emptiness must have opened up inside her. Years later, I dis this is an additional comment. Years later, I discovered that this was how she experienced the fear of annihilation as a person. So, monadic construed. Diana is a green, so she resented my arrival. Okay, so that's it. Yeah. Uh, I always felt my existence shamed her. Pregnancy is a fall from grace, so that's still relational, isn't it? It's still dyadic. It's something about um, a regret that that ultimate form. I do not doubt that she blamed me for the breast abscesses. She, she complained my coffee disturbed her sleep. She gave me boiled sweets to prevent the coffee. Dialy process. Dorothy says of Mara, she knew nothing of my imminent arrival. She was told at school, you are very lucky, you have a baby sister. Okay, actually that's triangular, isn't it? Because a teacher told her that. But I mean, these, these categories of monadic, dyadic, and triadic um, 
are always, uh, I mean, you could say that any relational situation always contains the three levels, but it's still useful to isolate them into one main predominant, predominating situation uh, or another in another situation. So I, I, I put that in green for dad because I can imagine Myra, oh, I've got a baby sister, you know, gosh, that's amazing. Huh? You know, so it's between, it's about Myra and Dorothy. And then we've got some tragedy ones. So Dorothy says, mother was not coping, so she sent my sister to an aunt when I was born. Okay, you can say it was quadratic, couldn't you? Is that the right word? The argument is, I won't go into it now, that we don't need to go up to four, that the processes that we described with three are enough to describe more complex than situations. Myra told me my mother rubbed my face in my wee when I was a baby. Now that's a quite a complex tragic little uh, scenario isn't it? Did she really do that? She might have just been making it up. Very cool, you know, but there's three protagonists. Um, I was born to parents who did not want me. Triadic, well, you could say it was dyadic because each parent was equally saying, I, don't, I didn't want to have this baby. It's not really saying much about the relationship between. If we said that the parents agreed that they didn't really want me, that would be fully triadic. Is that making some clarity? Does it always have to involve people or can it involve No. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. The focus of convenience, this guy would say, is people here. But do you have an idea of another um, air domain? Well, I was just thinking of other environments of uh, an event or, let's say, in a workplace situation. So you've got political culture within the environment of, of the organization. Um, so you know, the yeah. promotion was given to someone else. There's something else going on there. Like somebody yeah. gave that promotion to somebody else. So Isn't that about people? It is, absolutely. But I thought you were talking about sort of non human objects. Uh, yeah, I, I was just, I did have that uh, concept, and I just wanted to know if it just applied to people or if events could be well, part of I have an image of uh, playing snooker. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you're thinking, right, I've got to get that ball to hit that ball. In order for that one, <laughs> that'd be trying. I caused her to be taken away from my mother, her father, her treasured bedroom where I was an intruder. The bedroom. It's uh, again a very it's good material, isn't it? Uh, when I was reading a book, I thought it's going to make great example. So. Let's get to another exercise. So um, here we are. I'm going to give you exercise three or exercise four. Just do one of them. Exercise three is the same as the EPG, tracing time. Again, you could use rapid or long-term events. And you're looking at the three relationships that there are between three siblings. Okay, so this is your construing now of how things were between you and your sister in early childhood, you and your sister when you were an adolescent, you and your sister now. Okay. And then doing each one. That's exercise three. So either do that one, if that seems to be uh, interesting, or this is allowing each of the three to have their voice obviously again through you but again looking at the three sibling relationships how do they, how to self-construe let's do let's make this one about a situation i think that's probably better you could say it in general but i think that would get too complex so let's say that the three think of a time when you three siblings if, you, if that's what you've got were together at an at an occasion I'm filling the grid around that, the memories of that experience. So, that's exercise four. So, just do one of those. If you have time, you can go and do the other one, but I'll give you five minutes to fill one of those in. That's three. 
three. Constructs triadic. What sort of uh, phrasing came out for covering a dyadic process or relationship or interaction? Just pull the construct out. Can you, can you share a couple of those with me? I'm wanting to share more. Wanting to share more. Yeah. Nice one. Is that one that? Wanting to share more, hang on. Is that about the two of them? So they're both wanting to share more? Yes. Because it occurs to me that you could get two people in which one person wanted to share more and the other didn't. Like right. Self sibling one. So as you went down the time, something um, was achieved. Okay, going down the time, early child wanting to share more. Um, wanting to be more independent. Yes. That's me. And yeah. uh, now wanting to be closer. And when you say more independent, you mean of that other person. Yeah, so it's dyadic. Mm -hmm. If you said I wanted to be more independent in general, we could argue that was monadic. Mm -hmm. But oh, yes. independent of a person or as a. Yes. Yeah. Any other? Temporary, tentative, and tenuous. <laughs> the T's. Yeah, the T's. I tend to think of threes anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, so that hasn't changed over time. It's. it's oh, yeah, you're yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, can you. Do you mind saying a bit? I mean, when you said temporary, what, what was it? Well, it was always um, the contact with my two other brothers is very um, event related. So, it's only when. The, an occasional crisis or family event that gets right. us together. So it's always temporary in the sense that it's we never go in depth, it never have a meaningful r rapport or, or dialogue. Yeah, yeah. So tenuous is always there's always a tension of. Did you do it over time or did you do it? Yeah, over time. Yeah. So if you were to now do that one, right? Uh, and this is um, a, yeah. fe a feeling of yeah. It's only an event. They don't. What? What? Can you guess what the other two's version of the same situation would be? Oh, it's very entrenched. I would say. They're, they're What's the content of it, though? Uh, rivalry. Yeah. So, so there's a constant jockeying. To yeah. Have a, a sense of superiority. Yeah. Sounds deeply familiar to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think just in general, but across these as well, the act of producing bread and consciousness that each of the other players in producing their own bread. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making assumptions about the perspective of that. Of course. And, and, and it brings to life the, con the consciousness that should they do a bread, yes. it may be very different. So, you know, it just brings, for me, it accentuates the fact that it's just a, it's my yeah. perception. Well, well, next time you meet. <laughs> if I keep an early answer. <laughs> so let's just think about the triadic level a bit. There's three people. An example, by the way, of, uh, of uh, triadic construction is nicely given by the, uh, the scenario of A is introducing B to C. Because people have argued that you could reduce that to um, dyadic, you need this triadic level. Can you reduce that? And another example is that I give Leslie this thing. We can reduce that to I put it on the table and then she picks it up. But is that giving? It isn't, is it? So giving is tri genuinely triadic birth construct. And a fully interpersonal. Because it involves three items. Items, but not 
No, but this, this is the equivalent of that person. You know that the giving uh, example is the classic first example of, of uh, triadicity. So when you're in a triadic situation, you construe each person, you construe yourself, you construe A, you construe B, monadically, you construe A, self A, and self B, and A, B, and then you also construe the whole damn caboodle with these triadic uh, constructs. What are some commonly uh, occurring triadic constructs in our, in our language? They were as close as I was distant. It makes it dynamically um, related. Tremendously important for Byron to preserve a picture of mother as being good. She wiped her intense fear of mother. She wiped her intense fear of her mother from her memory. Since she did not dare blame her mother for her actions. Since she did not dare blame her mother for her unhappiness, she blamed me. Okay, penultimate exercise. <laughs> um, just taking your three pieces or two sips on another person could be a parent or a, uh, another relative and try and describe how it was for you this situation maybe or the general scenario of the relationship try and get into your siblings point of view right how they would have seen the same thing and how the third party would have seen it Yeah, so my eldest brother, it's all about power and gaining respect through power. Yeah. Uh, the second born, the one just above me, it's all about accomplishment. Yeah. As a way of getting respect. Yeah. And for me, my my way of generating the respect that I orient my world to is through confidence. Competence. Yeah. So yeah. Showing that I'm confident. Very interesting. Yeah. Really neat. Like yeah, that. that was a great self respect. Unfortunately, we've uh, got quite um, close to the end now. Uh, I just wanted to show you that career that I invented uh, ah, there you go. a few days ago. <laughs> yeah. Somebody thought it would be nice to... Well, the idea of this grid now, this exercise for you, is for you to have an overview of all the things that you've been thinking about doing the workshop and to see if you can get some general, something general out of it, okay? So the idea here is to think about what it's like to be a firstborn from all the examples you've heard or from your own exercises that you've done, what it's like to be a middleborn and what it's like to be the youngest in the family. Um, so the first row, this is an example of a qualitative grid where you have a more specific question and I've used this sort of form for um, something called the reflective practice grid and the supervision grid. I've been using grids in clinical supervision, in which, which is naturally a triadic situation, isn't it? Why is it? Yeah, yeah. supervisor, therapist, and the case. Mm -hmm. And as you're listening to your therapist telling your supervisor, you're listening to the therapist talking, you're thinking all the time, 
mm, she told me that she thinks this, but I don't know that she thinks that. <laughs> so I've designed a grid which is in a paper called Reflective Practice. Go on the website, these papers. Um, so fill this grid in, thinking in general, also, it's not going to be the same thing, of course, but what kinds of things might stick out as being important in being a firstborn? What's it like to be a firstborn? What's it like to be middleborn in, this, in the same sort of situation, let's say? And what's it like to be the youngest? And then give an example of that. And then the final one is do a Kelly and Triadic elicitation, like we did with Roland. Um, how are two of those similar and the other different? Does that make sense as an exercise? We haven't got long, so get to work. Two thirds of children reported that mothers favoured either their or their siblings. Considerable differences in the term of process. Only a minority of mothers reported feeling a similar intensity of affection for their different children. Interaction between mother and later born has a marked effect on the first born. Children living closely monitor the discourse between parents and siblings. I just abstracted these from a mass of data. And the parents behave differently to children in real time when siblings are at different ages. How they behave towards children when they are of similar ages. So you get some parents who really like a child at a two-year-old stage of life. <laughs> uh, so as each child goes through the two-year-old stage, they, they get a really good deal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really wild example now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a triadic example there. A three-year-old who receives little affection daily witnessing a particular affection shown to a 12-month-old younger sibling. Many children see notable differences between themselves and their siblings in every respect, aspect of their interaction, including pairs of identical twins. Even when feeling warm about each other, what they enjoy about each other are usually different. The difference is most marked in positive aspects of interaction and in dominance and control shown by the two. And I made a little general comment about qualitative groups there. Um, I think what it's powerful for doing is to almost give you a grammar, as it were, of uh, what I a blank grid presents an array of possibilities. In other words, often we don't know what's in there. You know, when we're, I mean, all today we don't know what the other parties are thinking, but if you draw the grid and you see that blank cell, you know that it was something. So that there's uh, a range of possibilities that could be put in each cell that would give you a kind of grammar of how into human interaction works. Does that make sense? Uh, this provides us with a grammar with which to proceed in inquiry into interpersonal situations. That's it.